let's be honest, we wouldn't have had this huge resurgence in terms of representation had movies like Black Panther, had movies like Crazy Rich Asians not made any money. If those movies bomb, we don't see a big push for diversity because I'll tell you right now, um, the, the, uh, the BIPOC community has been pushing for representation and all this stuff for decades, decades and decades and decades. And the biggest t pushback has always been, there is no audience for this. We will not make any money for it. This is not going to work. This is why we're not going to do this. And then suddenly you have two blockbuster films that make a shit ton of money. And then all of a sudden it's diversity. Talent Talk is sponsored by Company of Rogues Actors Studio, New York style training for actors at all stages of their journey. With our part-time classes and full-time masterclass program, Rogues provides a unique post-secondary option under the guidance of working professionals. Mentoring and developing professional film and theater artists since 1993, Calgary's longest-running independent studio offers practical hands-on classes in a positive, supportive environment. Check us out at corogues.com. Company of Rogues, passionate about the art of acting. Folks, I'm Gary McLean. You're watching Talent Talk. Thanks for tuning in. If you haven't done so already, please do go to the Talent Talk YouTube channel and subscribe today. As always, the support's appreciated. And also a reminder that this and previous episodes are available on podcast mediums such as Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, just to name a few. Essentially, wherever you listen to your podcast, it's probably there. Please check it out. And finally, this, our fifth season, we have some sponsors that I would love to give a quick shout out to. Uh, let's start off with Six Degrees Sound and Music. They do our in-studio, uh, in-person audio recording and editing. Now, this is a remote session, so they're not necessarily uh, involved, but they've been supportive nonetheless. We also have Workflow Film, who does our video recording and editing for our in-person, in-studio session. So thank you to them. We have uh, Company of Rogues, which is a Calgary local acting school and studio. We have RJ Talent, which is a local talent agency, Heard of One Media, Counting Coup Indigenous Film Academy, and finally, Actra Alberta. So thank you to those fine folks for helping elevate us in this fifth season. Now, today's guest, I'm very excited to have this guy on here. Uh, he, you know, he was actually born in South Korea, but uh, he and his family moved to Calgary when he was just a wee lad. And uh, yeah, from there, he kind of moved on to Toronto, went to the University of Toronto to pursue his dream of becoming an actor. Now, since then, he has gone on to do a lot of great things, including being a four-time Canadian Screen Award winner for Best uh, Actor in a Comedic Series. So super excited to have one of Canada's favorite people on the show today. So please welcome me in joining Paul Sun Young Lee to the show. Hello, sir, and hopefully I didn't screw up the name too badly. <laughs> no, no, you got Paul pronounced perfectly. Awesome, so that's, much, that's what I was aiming for. <laughs> it's funny, actually, uh, I've had people so worried about uh, mispronouncing my first name that they, 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 they mispronounce, like, my entire name. So I've been referred to, I've been introduced as Pong Sung Gung Lee. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like, absolute hatchet jobs, but I get it, I get it. You know, it's, it is one of these things, you want to get it right, and sometimes... As human beings, we, we try a little bit too hard and, and everything gets jumbled up. But uh, you, you said it perfectly, so it's great. Thank you. Oh, great. And, and you know what? And that, funny enough, I actually meant to ask before we started recording how to pronounce it properly. <laughs> and I totally forgot to ask you that. So. No worries. No worries. But uh, no, again, thank you for taking the time to sit down and chat with us today. Definitely appreciate that. I know you're a busy guy. Um, <laughs> Maybe not as busy as you were at the moment with <laughs> current situation going on, but uh, nonetheless, um, thank you so much. And yeah, if you don't mind, because I know there's certain things we can't really discuss today, mm -hmm. but I would love to kind of know your journey of, of what brought you to your current level that you're at. Right yeah. Now. Uh, well, you know, it's a long story. Uh, I mean, my parents, like you, you mentioned before, I was born in South Korea. Uh, but three months after I was born, my parents immigrated to Canada, and we actually lived in London, Ontario. And thus began my journey as an immigrant son. Um, my parents had to work super hard uh, to give my sister and I um, the opportunities uh, that we've had in life. 
And that's one of the reasons why they immigrated to Canada. They gave up, um, you know, their homeland, a culture and a language that they were familiar with. Uh, and pulled up stakes and moved to a completely different country just to give my sister and I those opportunities. And so they were they are absolutely overjoyed to learn that uh, I had taken this wonderful opportunity they had given me and, and wanted to pursue acting. Uh, I myself didn't, it wasn't a lifelong dream. I didn't know I wanted to be an actor when I was younger, growing up, um, because my parents were always working. Uh, the babysitter uh, was television, basically. Uh, back then, you could leave your kids alone. And uh, so they did. Um, we actually did have a babysitter for a bit, but things didn't work out because there was a little bit of, uh, um, well, yeah, let, let's say, let's. Let, so there, there's a bit of abusive behavior happening there. We weren't treated the best in, in that way. Uh, you know, nothing sexual or anything like that, but it was just like we were not treated like human beings in a sense, more like animals. Like, you know, we, we, had to, we couldn't eat at the table. We had to eat in the boot room type thing. And so when my parents found that out, they weren't very happy about that. So they said, you know what? Instead of trusting somebody else, we're just going to leave them alone. And so my sister and I were at home. Um, and so, yeah, our babysitter was the television. So I learned not only to speak English by watching TV. Um, you know, I, I learned my love of stories and consuming stories and storytelling came from that medium. Uh, and so growing up, you know, I didn't even it didn't even re register in my mind that I could be an actor just because I never saw anybody who looked like me on TV. You know what I mean? Uh, so when you know when I I use the term representation matters, it's not just a catchy phrase. This is something that absolutely a hundred percent I do believe in because had I seen somebody who looked like myself uh, on the screens in a positive manner, I think it would have my life might have turned out a little bit more differently. But uh, I mean, as it was. Uh, whenever I did see somebody who kind of looked like me or my family, they were often the uh, the target of, uh, you know, uh, derision, basically. Uh, they were meant to be outsiders. They were laughed at. They were ridiculed, meant to be, you know, shown to be exotic or strange or just like plain weird. And so when you're growing up and you see people who look like your family treated that way, you kind of learn subconsciously that, uh, you know, your family is weird or your family is meant to be mocked and your stories don't matter. Right. So it was one of those things where as a, at a young age that that kind of an influence it had on me was, you know, I kind of wanting to fit in, turn my back on my own culture and my, my parents heritage uh, as it were. And I think I missed out on an awful lot because of that. Um, but uh, yeah, my journey to be an actor was like, uh, I went to high school in Calgary. Uh, I went to St. Winston Churchill high school and I was part of the IB program. Um, and, uh, my parents really wanted me to, to take that education and, and, and go into a profession where I wouldn't have to struggle to make ends meet and stuff like that. And, uh, so yeah, they were absolutely overjoyed when I decided I want to be an actor, uh, because then that way I would never suffer. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And it just, I fell into acting just really quite by accident. Um, I, uh, was applying to go to U U university. And my girlfriend at the time was going to Toronto. She was going to University of Toronto to study there. And uh, in all my wisdom, I was like, I want to go there too, just to be with her. And so I was trying to pick out courses. And I was actually going to go into, I was going to major in uh, um, English and uh, fine arts, actually. I wanted, to, I wanted to draw. I was very artistic back then. And I was really heavily into sketching and drawing and cartooning and stuff like that. And I think my original plan was I wanted to be a journalist. Right. Because that's okay. that's kind of, you know, um, I got into Carleton University for journalism, but because my girlfriend was going to U of T, well, I had to go to U of T. And um, so I went to U of T and uh, they didn't have a journalism program there, but I saw that they had a drama program. And I kind of thought, well, we did some sketch presentations in, in English class. I really enjoyed it. I really liked, you know, writing these sketches and performing in them in a way. Uh, sounds like fun. So on a lark, I just sort of a. Uh, uh, applied for the drama program at the university college uh, at U of T. And uh, that is a harrowing story in of itself because I'd never, ever taken any sort of theater program, any sort of acting program at, in high school or, or, or whatnot. I was in a couple of church plays, but that's about it. Right. And um, yeah, went through that, got into the program and fell in love with the, the craft of acting. And then that's, that's where it kind of dawned on me that, Oh my God, I can, learn this craft and I can get a job doing this 
this is perfect. Like, what could go wrong? Uh, and um, yeah, it was just like, you know, school was great. I was terrible because I'd never had any sort of formal performance training, but I learned a lot, fell in love with it. Um, really, really found a drive for it and a passion for it. Divested myself into it, like invested myself into it, like in, uh, an incredible amount. Uh, and then when I graduated, was just sort of slapped in the face with the fact that, oh, people aren't hiring people who look like me because of the color of my skin, the types of roles that were forwarded to me. Well, first of all, it was hard to even just try to get a job because while U of T is great for academics, it's really, really bad for practical world applications. Like, you know, I could tell you all about theater history in Europe. Uh, I could tell you all about the different forms of, you know, history, uh, theater in Europe and in North America, but in terms of actually getting a job, like the, you know, the importance of an agent, the unions, all that stuff was like zero. We did not cover that at all in university because it's, it's an academic state setting. So, you know, it was, my life was fraught with a lot of, uh, you know, um, roadblocks, hazards along the way, things that sort of stopped me from becoming an actor. Uh, but as I'm fond of saying, I was just too stupid and too stubborn to quit. So I just sort of kept pushing forward. And uh, like a lot of things kind of fell ass backwards into it. And, uh, you know, I, th it makes me kind of believe that if it's meant to be, it's meant to be, you know, it's, it's just, you just got to keep plugging away at it and keep working at it. Not that you expect stuff to happen to you, but a lot of the, the opportunities I got, I kind of fell into um, quite unwittingly. And, uh, you know, learn my lesson that you need to be prepared for when these opportunities come up. And that that's how it kind of got uh, translated uh, into my career. Because, uh, yeah, starting off, graduating from university, couldn't get a job, didn't know how, gave up acting for a bit, uh, worked in the technical side of theater for about a year, really hated that, learned that this was not what I wanted to do. And then again, um, asked backwards, I fell into it where uh, a former university instructor of mine was doing a play, needed me to be in it. So I joined in, somebody saw me in another, you know, in that play. Uh, and they said, Hey, we need an actor. Let's, let's, let's audition this guy. Got that role, you know, and one role led to another role. And then that part was a particularly good play, really good for me uh, in terms of the showcase and uh, a castmate, his agent came and saw me and was like, Oh, is he being represented by somebody? So, so through no real sort of groundwork of my own, I was able to parlay all these sort of missteps into getting work as an actor and getting representation. And then once I got that legitimate sort of agent, the door opened and I was able to plug away. But even then there were limitations in terms of the types of roles I was allowed to audition for that they would see me for based solely on the color of my skin. So, and my physical appearance too, because film and TV is a very visual medium and I was losing my hair at a young age. And so I couldn't possibly play somebody my own age because I would, I didn't have hair. Right. So like things like that, like really, really weird life things. And I'm rambling. So I'll just, no, no, it's, it's <laughs> I mean, I asked for your journey and you've given me your journey. That's great. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. And uh, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, to be honest. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm kind of curious as time has gone on and in more recent years, have you found that, the color of your skin matters less or is it still pretty prominent or no. are you still looking at those stereotypical roles? No, I, I don't see any of these stereotypical roles anymore. Um, the color of my skin still is a prominent sort of indicator of, of, of um, I mean, it's, it's part of my makeup. It's who I am. Sure. Right. And it, it, with that, because representation has, been sort of pushed to the forefront in terms of casting choices. You know, you hear the words authenticity being bandied about in a lot of auditions. Now we want this to be authentic. So we're going to do this. Like back in the day, it was, I remember auditioning for parts and they were very Asian specific parts and often required an accent. And, uh, and often they didn't care what accent it was. I mean, that's how poorly written these parts were. There weren't really characters. They were caricatures. They were, uh, you know, two dimensional sort of set pieces to sort of move the story along um, to serve another narrative, basically. And so like, 
you know, disposable characters that just sort of came out, barfed up exposition and then left or were there for like color, you know, background of color. Oh, this is an exotic, dangerous world inhabited by people who look different with who speak differently and who are very dangerous and, 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 and whatnot. You know, it's like rather ridiculous uh, sort of almost fairy tale type uh, stories. And I remember auditioning for parts where it's like, okay, well, we need an Asian accent. And I would say, okay, what kind, you know, Asian. <laughs> it's like, so you don't care and you wouldn't know really if it made, and there was no thought to, does this make sense? That, hey, look, we want somebody there and they're going to have an accent and they're Asian. So, like, give us, we don't care if it's Japanese or Chinese or Korean or whatever. It just has to sound different and Asian, right? right? And it was just, like, the ridiculousness of all of that and the disrespect, really, at the end of the day. But, I mean, with the passage of time and the growing of knowledge and and the world becoming a lot uh, more, um, I guess, not empathetic, but like, like, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, more knowledgeable, basically, like more respectful for cultures. Like people know more that, that like, for example, they know that China is a completely different country than Japan or Korea or Thailand or Vietnam or all these different places. Like people sound, they have their own languages, right? Like that's, that's the thing. And like that knowledge, because with the advent of the internet and the globe shrinking and all this information being at our fingertips. And not only that, all these other types of shows from all over the world being accessible now to people, people are more in the know. They're, they're, they're much, audiences are far more sophisticated now just because they have access to more and they're exposed to different, not only different types of stories, but different performers from all over the world. When I was a young actor, the the biggest fight against casting uh, minority actors, uh, or you know, like uh, for example, Ridley Scott, great filmmaker, does a movie called you know, set in ancient Egypt called Gods and whatever, does not cast one Egyptian person or of Egyptian descent as a lead character. Instead, hires a bunch of white people and says, and his excuse is, well, nobody knows any of these any Egyptian actors who are big or this or that. And nobody knows, like, there's no star power. So we can't make money off it because audiences won't connect with these actors. And the actors drive it. And you kind of go, okay, well, that's, can I swear? Go for it. That's bullshit. Yeah. Right? First of all, that's complete bullshit. Um, there is a market for it. Audiences are far more sophisticated. And it's not, well, the actors, I do believe, do have a certain drawing power. The story should also have a big, big sort of like the writing needs to be a big factor in it too, because uh, a good actor can make shitty dialogue seem better, but at the end of the day, you're still putting makeup on a pig. And so, you know, you've got to have all the scene. And to, to intonate that, you know, the only good actors are white actors is absolute bullshit too. Absolutely. So, yeah. um, you know, they, there were all these, 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 these limiters that were put, all these little things that were, and you know, that's, that's all a part of systemic racism and it's all part of what people know and what they're comfortable with. And that shapes their aesthetic and that shapes their, their ability to judge what true talent is. And it gives you biases. And I, you know, I like that's, that's fine. What it shows though, is like, you know, like the great divide between old school thinking and just modern realism is the fact that, you know, if you open your mind up and get rid of these prejudices and these biases or just, kind of go, okay, let's, let's, let's truly see what's out there. You'd be surprised at the level, the wealth of talent that is available on a global scale instead of being caught in this little myopic world because everybody fets you or you're comfortable with it or this or that. The sign of a true artist is really to get out of that comfort zone. And if you're a great artist, you can take whatever material and elevate it. Right. You don't have to stick with same old, same old type thing. And I understand film and TV. It's about making money because let's be honest, we wouldn't have had this huge resurgence in terms of representation had movies like Black Panther, had movies like Crazy Rich Asians not made any money. If those movies bomb, we don't see a big push for diversity because I'll tell you right now, um, the the. Uh, the BIPOC community has been pushing for representation and all this stuff for decades. 
decades and decades and decades. And the biggest t- pushback has always been, there is no audience for this. We will not make any money for it. This is not going to work. This is why we're not going to do this. And then suddenly you have two blockbuster films that make a shit ton of money. And then all of a sudden it's diversity, representation. Yes, absolutely. We're going to do this. And so like, I, I am a realist enough and cynical enough to kind of go, if these movies don't make any money, nobody gives a shit if it's critically good. It could, yeah. you know, as long as it makes money and it's critically good, then it's like, oh my gosh, this is great. Representation does matter. Let's do it. The flip side of that is then, you know, uh, that uh, I'm losing my train of thought. The flip side of that is not to make it trendy, to keep pushing, right? To create better stories, not just tell the same story in a different way, create better stories. Also, let's train the next generation, not only in front of the cameras, but behind the cameras, the writers, the directors, the producers, the designers, right? People who can tell their stories from 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 a different point of view from their narrative and people like that bipoc uh you know producers and directors creatives um who have the power to say to to green light projects and this and that that's when you have true egalitarianism do you feel just because of the success of a couple of those films that it's it's more of a, a veil right of okay well it's popular now so yes let's push it yep and oh absolutely there's there's a sorry no go ahead I'll oh no see. no i i mean i 100 percent. like i like i know this is the thing crazy rich asians come out makes hundreds of millions of dollars hollywood the next uh uh pilot season green lights an unprecedented amount of shows that feature asian casts all asian casts asian stories but in all the taglines for every single one of those shows were the words crazy rich or asian showing the true fucking genius of you know the the, the the decision makers in hollywood because again they took somebody and let, let's 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 face it there's a bit of fear in terms of well we don't want to take a loss by investing in something that is outside the box we want something safe that's going to generate money that's going to be sustainable and so we know this formula works so we're going to do a derivative of all of this stuff i love marvel movies right but it, it's like there's there's really there's a fatigue that's happening absolutely in that everybody's going okay it's another it's another suit and they're great movies but it's like if you love steak and potatoes and you have to eat it every day you're not gonna like steak and potatoes after a bit i guarantee you it doesn't matter how well it's made you're gonna go i'm i need something i need something else in my diet because i haven't pooped for months and i need something else right it's like that and so you can take something that you love too much of some of anything isn't isn't great. So, you know, that that's that's in terms of the actual movement itself for for BIPOC stories and performers and stuff like that. I think it is one about continual evolution. It is one where you and I think all artists should be striving for this, not just BIPOC artists. Everybody should be striving to do this, to, to build your art. Like you said, I'm wondering if it's just the Hollywood machine of mm being like you said everything's cookie cutter everything is hey this worked in the past we want to do this the safe thing right yeah um and that's why we're seeing so many remakes or rehashes of previous shows and everything else and i don't know at me as a viewer i'm tired of that like you said Mm -hmm. i'm tired of the steak and potatoes give me something different uh i'm wondering if that's where as an independent film community if we could elevate ourselves to to do something different Oh, I think, but that that's the role of the indie, of indie, you know, Absolutely, the, right? the independent community is to, is to rock the boat and to do something that is just, that, that touches, uh, strikes a chord with the audiences. Because, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you look at these, the studios and go, holy shit, this is, this is a big indie hit. What, what do they do? Let's buy it and let's exploit it and let's make our own version of it, right? I mean, but I think the indie community, that's always been their, that's been their go-to and their jam is to yeah. be the ones to lead the charge. And to to perform the art and to be stay off the beaten path, right? Um, but really, everybody in the indie community too, they, they want to make money as well. Like I get it. You want to sign that big fat deal and have those resources. It's not just like material wealth and yeah, I can finally get that Rolls Royce or whatever. It's the resources to make the types of films where you don't have to worry as much about compromising some of your vision sometimes. Because now we can afford that crane shot. 
or now we can afford to sign this one person, right? To have this kind of thing, right? It's, it's just, you know, at least that's how I kind of see it. But the indie community has always been about the ones who are the trailblazers and the pathfinders. You know what? I, like, I, yeah, I know we've we've definitely covered a lot here. Um, and I think I'm kind of happy to hear that you feel that there is growth kind of happening in terms yeah. of equality and things like that. I'm, I'm hoping it's not just a trend. Um, we still got a ways to go. We do. Still, I right? mean, it's I, way better. But it- Where I struggle with it is not that itself, but with – it seems in a lot of areas outside of film, we're mm-hmm. regressing yeah. in a lot of ways as a, yeah. as a society. And so that's why I was kind of asking the question, like, do you think it's just temporary or do you foresee a regression in our industry in that regard as well? That's where I was. Yeah, no, I don't see that. That's the thing. I think the pushback that you're talking about in society, there are a number of different factors and I can only speak to, to what's going on from the Asian community point of view, I mean, uh, coming out of the pandemic really, which was absolutely horrible for everybody. Um, you know, the, the, the fact is the Asian community was largely targeted and victimized, uh, because you know, the, 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 the rumor was, Hey, COVID came from China, damn Chinese. Right. Right, And that was spurred upon by certain members, um, you know, in high political places, uh, and you know, just people as a whole can be really shitty. And the thing is, it's easier to just have point the blame at somebody and not do any research. And it's easier to just have a scapegoat and go. I'd like to think honestly, that there are more good people out there, uh, than, than we realize. And the ones who are being the real assholes always get all the attention. I am going to kind of wrap it up here, but before sure. we do that, I'm going to, the one question I want to ask you is, so out of your, your long prestigious career that you've done so far, is there a, a genre or a character type that you've really wanted to play that you haven't had an opportunity to play yet? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I've always, <laughs> I've always wanted to play an athlete. Okay. Yeah, I've always wanted to play an athlete, either a hockey player or a baseball player. Um, an ex at, at this point in my career, it would have to be somebody who is who is not in their prime anymore. Um, right. But uh, yeah, no, like uh, like Paul Newman in Slapshot. Uh, no, I can't talk about movies. <laughs> sorry. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. We'll cut that Damn one it. out. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> Um, no, but yeah, yeah. And I've but always, I understand what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. And I've always, you know, like it, it's interesting because with the, there's certain crossovers in the roles, like I'd always wanted to do sci-fi, which is great. And now I'm able to play in those worlds. Um, I'd love to be in a run, not a raunchy, but like a really good buddy road comedy, buddy, okay, buddy yeah. road comedy, which is something. Um, and, uh, you know, growing up too, although guns frighten me, uh, my mom really loved war movies like historical war movies and stuff like that i'd love to do something like that as well to be to be in one of those um and uh you know like everybody else i'd love to play detective or cop hard-nosed cop or or something right. like that or even a comedy doing that like i'd, I'd love to do to, to be in those genres like like play in those comedy. types of roles yeah <laughs> i mean uh, to be honest i'm surprised you haven't played a detective or a cop yet i yeah. mean i, I have I like little wee roles and stuff, right. but nothing substantial. You know what I mean? Like I'd love to gotcha. be, you know, the the guy pushing the narrative instead of serving Absolutely. the narrative. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. No, that's very cool. Um, yeah, I'm kind of with you. And I don't know if this stems back to the, just the childhood of playing war when I was a kid or whatever. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like military thing is something I always kind of wanted to play. And yeah. But uh, yeah, because it's like you have all the drama and all the action and none of the none of the danger, right? So exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. I do appreciate it. And I, I, I loved the conversation. Uh, hopefully it was good for you as well. It was. And, thank uh, you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, best of luck. Hopefully we can start negotiations soon or you know, say I can start some negotiations. October soon. 2nd. I hear they're going back to the table to start negotiations. So that's Nice. Great. I mean, the WGA thing, I think, has helped. Yeah. Hopefully Step in the right direction. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. So hopefully we can continue that, that trend and get yeah. back to work. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So thanks again. And uh, everybody else, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.